Michael Rothberg, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hey, Howie. It's great to be here. Yeah. So we've we've talked about COVID two or three times now, and it seems weird that I understand less about it now than I did a year ago. Um, but apparently, like, you know, science has advanced. There's a but like when I look at the political messages, the messages from from medical authorities, when I see what people are doing out in the wild, um, I'm really confused. So uh, maybe, yeah. maybe we just begin by it's, just like, what are you seeing out there? Like, yeah. So, you know, what happened is that, that COVID has changed. So it's not that, you know, you sort of look at it and you say, oh, well, I thought I figured this out and we should know more and more about it. Uh, it's not the same thing. It's not that we we learned a lot about what happened in the past, but what happened in the past doesn't necessarily work for what we have in, in the present. And it used to be that you would just sort of needed to know how much COVID was there in my area to kind of determine your behavior. But now it's not just how much COVID, but which kind of COVID, because we're using the same name for it. We're calling it COVID-19, but it's it's a different disease now than it was when it started. And so that's why you're getting these changed messages, uh, you know, coming from the official channels. Um, but you've also got people who have um, dug into some kind of political messages around COVID, which, you know, really were never appropriate in the first place. This wasn't a political disease. This is a, this is a public health issue. And so um, I think that there are some major lessons that we've learned that have been true throughout the pandemic and are still true. And then there are other things that are changing as time goes on, which which makes, you know, people's approaches are going to have to vary. And it depends on who you are and where you live and when it is. So I'll go into more detail about yeah. those specifics. Okay. Um, so, I mean, one of the things that I've always, you know, loved about your mind and talking to you is, and I think this is like on your Twitter profile that like you, you will change your opinion based on new data. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, I don't like doing that. I, I, I find, I find that, uh, very <laughs> tiresome. Um, so when I think about like, you know, I was on the, I was on the, the science side, from the very beginning, like, of course, we should mm -hmm. close the schools. Of course, everybody should mask up. Of course, we should social distance. Of course, we should have these lockdowns. And like, oh, you know, it's been hard, you know, like I want to sort of continue thinking those things that I thought because it's it's easier than than changing. Like what from that sort of liberal public health science minded perspective do you think is no longer valid or has shifted? with, you know, with changing times. Yeah. So let's go back to like the beginning of the pandemic. Right. And so at the very beginning, we had this disease, which was extremely dangerous with a very high mortality rate, particularly for older people uh, and for people who had various comorbid illnesses. So it was a really dangerous disease. But it also had lots of people who were asymptomatic. And so anyone sort of could be carrying it. And there were lots of people who had relatively mild cases. And so you had to kind of like look at the whole picture to get an idea of, um, you know, how bad is this and, and how important is it from a public health perspective for us to try to contain it. And realize at that point, we had basically no treatment for it. The only thing we could do was put people on ventilators when they couldn't breathe anymore. And we didn't have enough ventilators in the country. And the ventilators weren't very effective. That is to say, most of the people that went on the ventilators ended up dying. And so really, the only way to try to prevent it was to stop the spread. And so that was why we had, you know, I mean, people talk about lockdowns. I don't remember ever having a lockdown. I remember there were a lot of things that were closed, but certainly in Ohio, we never had a period where we couldn't travel, where I couldn't go outside, where I couldn't go to the park, where I, I know I was never locked in my house the way that people in China were. 
Um, and so, but, but we had, you know, a real closing of a lot of businesses. Uh, and the idea was that we were going to make uh, economic sacrifices in order to preserve public health and save lives. And that was completely appropriate. Um, you know, there, there was no reason for people to be going and eating in restaurants and, um, you know, going and gathering in large numbers uh, where they were going to have super spreader events. And um, one of the other dangers back then was also the hospitals being overwhelmed, as we saw, like in New York and where they're just, you know, the hospitals didn't have enough space to take care of all the people with COVID. And so that was the appropriate approach back then. Uh, and then since then, we've had a number of developments that have really changed uh, the need for that. And, you know, I hear a lot of conservatives talking about lockdowns. I haven't seen anything, you know, certainly no lockdowns and nothing that even approached uh, what we had back in the beginning. That is to say, I haven't seen any businesses closed in Ohio since that very first wave of the pandemic. Um, and there's really no reason to close any businesses. Um, and there's also, you know, no reason that people can't gather, um, even in reasonably large numbers. Um, so the things that have changed since the beginning of the pandemic. So first of all, we have vaccine. And so the vaccines have made a huge difference in the severity of the disease. Um, and, but not recently in the transmission of the disease. So that's one of the things that changed when the vaccine first came out. It was extremely effective, both at preventing the disease and preventing any complications from the disease. So when the vaccine came out and I got my two doses and I had a 95% protection against the disease, I could take off my mask and I could walk around like I was Superman. I could walk around with impunity and I didn't have to worry at all. Um, and what's happened is we discovered two things. One is that the vaccine kind of wears off over time. The protection of the vaccine declines, you know, over a relatively short time so that by, you know, six months after you were vaccinated, you needed to get a booster. But that was OK because we had boosters. So I got a booster um, and I got a second booster. And I imagine this fall I'm going to need a third booster. And the other thing that happened is the virus evolved. So we have these variants. I'm sure you, you know, we, we talked about, you've heard in the news, we had Delta and then Omicron, and now we've got subvariants of Omicron. And each time the virus mutates, it evolves into an, basically what's almost a new virus. And so the, the strain that we have now um, is actually um, almost impervious to the vaccine in terms of um, spreading the disease. So just because you're vaccinated and boosted and up to date, you still have very little protection against the current virus in terms of being infected. So if you don't want to be infected, you need to stay away from large groups of people and you need to wear a mask. And uh, the other thing that's happened with the virus is it's become much more infectious. So the first initial COVID was not that easy to catch, the original SARS-CoV-2. But the Omicron variants are really easy to catch, you know, and basically like if you're in a room with a bunch of people and somebody's got it, you're going to have it. Um, and so now, you know, wearing a cloth mask is, is useless. There's no point in wearing a cloth mask. Even a surgical mask is not going to help you very much. Uh, you need an N95 or an N99 or an N100. You know, you can you can get better and better masks. Um, and I'll talk about the masks um, a, 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 in particular as, as one thing. And um, and then we've also got treatment now. So that's also different. Right. In the beginning, we had nothing. And then we had uh, steroids that we could give people that help to reduce the really, really severe people from, uh, you know, going on to a ventilator or from dying but they didn't keep you from getting COVID. Um, and then we came out with, you know, monoclonal antibodies. And now what we have is uh, the antiviral drugs, which are extremely effective in preventing hospitalization and death. And so, you know, the president's got COVID, he took the Paxlovid, and now he's, 
you know, you basically had a very, very mild course. Now, when you finish your five days, sometimes it comes back a little bit, but those people don't end up in the hospital. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the difference between sort of like when Trump got COVID and when Biden got COVID is sort of night and day. Um, and so, yeah, so we can go through a lot of examples of that. So what's changed? So the virus has changed. It is much more infectious than it was. It, the vaccine doesn't offer the same protection against catching the virus, but does offer the protection against being hospitalized or dying from the virus. And the other thing is that the Omicron variant is much less severe than the uh, Delta, you know, and the original strain. So um, we are seeing a lot of people hospitalized and it's not as clear whether they're hospitalized because of the COVID or with the COVID. You know, I mean, a lot of the sort of conservative talking points that you heard early on in the pandemic actually are probably true about the current version of the virus. They were not true back then when they would say, how do you know that the person died from COVID? They didn't just die with COVID. Um, and that was, that was just absolutely not the case back then. But now we've got, you know, lots of people in the hospital with COVID, very, very few in the ICU. So um, what we haven't been seeing is that same level of severity. One part of that is, you know, there are more people who are vaccinated. One part of it is we got more treatments, but this is also a much less severe version uh, of the disease than what we saw before. Gotcha. So um, like when I think about my own risk and I think I, I hear about people getting COVID mm -hmm. now, it's like they feel crappy for a, a week or a few days. I'm like, well, you know, I've done that. I could handle that. But then there's sort of the, the yeah. long shot of long COVID. And I'm, is, is long COVID mm -hmm. still a thing with the Omicron subvariants or? Yeah, who knows, <laughs> right? So yeah. that's part of like, you know, uh, as, as the new variants come out, we don't know all of the stuff about what the new variants represent, right? So the first thing we see with the new variants is, well, how many people are being hospitalized with them? And a few weeks after that, we find out how many people were hospitalized end up in the ICU and how many of them die. And then months after that, you might get an idea of how many of them get long COVID. You know, so I think a lot of what we're looking at about long COVID now is, you know, at the latest, the Delta variant, you know, people presenting with mm. long COVID from, you know, and so we don't really know. Um, but I tend to think that, you know, that this, these later variants, the Omicron variants are probably less likely to cause long COVID, but that is just a guess. You know, I, we don't have the data to back that up yet. We'll have to wait and find out. So, you know, um, in terms of like, you know, how should you think about this for yourself? So um, I think that, you know, the first question is which risk category do you consider yourself to be in? So if you are healthy and you're young, so when I say young, I'm going to say under the age of 50. Uh, you really have very little to fear from getting COVID. You know, it's going to be unpleasant, but, um, you know, the chances of, of your ending up in the hospital or dying from COVID is very, very, very small. And that was true all the way along, but it's even more, you know, more true now. Um, and if you're young and you've been vaccinated, uh, which is even better, and there's really no reason for young people not to be vaccinated, um, then that's, you know, that's great. You can really relax. Um, you know, three of my four children have had COVID, uh, you know, they're, they, and, and they live their lives a lot more fully than, than I do. And my wife does, you know, we're a little bit more limited in what we do. Um, we're over 50 and, you know, also going to large gatherings indoors is not so exciting for us. So it's not a big deal for us to, to miss out on that. But, um, but, you know, we do go to small events. Um, you know, if we're indoors, we wear a mask. If we're outdoors, then we don't. 
And uh, I think there's, you know, a reasonable chance I will get COVID at some point, but um, I'm not trying to get it. Um, and I, you know, take reasonable precautions to try to avoid it. Um, yeah. Well, I remember when we when we first talked, you know, over two, two, maybe two and a half years ago, just when it was was heating up, you were like, you know, we, we don't know, like when if someone gets COVID, like maybe all those people could then like take care of the sick people and they would be immune. Like, it, <laughs> like we had this yeah. fantasy of, of like, so the immunity like thing, other, yeah, go ahead. The immunity thing is interesting, right? So um, I've written a, a bunch of papers about, uh, you know, the, the um, effects of prior infection on future um, infection. And so if you've been infected, it does offer you some degree of immunity. Uh, it's just that the virus keeps changing. So people that got the original strain were protected actually uh, even against Delta, but they had very little protection against Omicron. And um, people with Delta had, you know, who got Delta had actually pretty good protection against Omicron. Now we're looking to see whether people that, um, you know, got Omicron are protected against the Omicron variants. So, um, you know, it, it, it is a, it's a moving target because the virus keeps changing. But basically, if you were infected before Delta, uh, you should not consider that that gives you any protection against the current variants. Um, gotcha. So is there... When, when, so I would, you know, I would go and get vaccinated even if I had been infected. Gotcha. Do the, do the names mean anything? Like, like are the the Omicron subvariants like all connected in some particular way, or is it more like like Apple names operating systems? Like one day they decide, okay, this one's twelve, and the last one was eleven. So, so the names are just you know Greek letters in order. Uh, so, um, you know, as they, uh, it really has to if if the. It does have to do with how different it is from the previous virus, um, but they're not necessarily more closely related to the previous letter. So the Omicron variant, for example, is more closely related to the original strain than it is to the Delta strain. Um, so um, there is, some, you know, the, the, the subvariants are still related to the same variant you know, more closely than they would be to a, a previous letter. But, okay. you know, that, that's, we, we don't know about how much previous infection will protect you against these new ones. And we keep hearing about, you know, there are lots and lots of people who have been uh, infected and reinfected and reinfected more than once. Um, but, you know, just because of, uh, some people are reinfected doesn't mean that you don't have any protection. And so I think that's that's part of, you know, what we're trying to understand is how much does does protect does uh, infection with any particular strain help to protect you going forward? And you know, one of the questions that's come up is that you know is Omicron so much less serious because there's so much um, you know immunity? in the population, either from previous infection or from, uh, from vaccination or both. So that there are very few people who haven't been exposed in one way or another, um, you know, to these viral proteins that, that allows them to have some um, basic immunity, or is it something actually intrinsic to the virus itself? Um, I don't know that it really matters that much, you know, as long as you took the opportunity to be vaccinated, if you could be, uh, and, uh, or if you got infected before you got vaccinated, you know, you're going to have some protection from that. Yeah. So what, one of the things that I've been a little bit confused about is, you know, vaccination when it was first announced was like a, a public health measure. You're doing it for yourself, but you're really doing it for the community. And like, it's, it seems like at least some of the things I've been reading that the like the global vaccination rates, which have been pretty low in many parts of the world, um, present a danger to us because that's like the, the the more transmission, the more opportunity for variation. And like it seems like we, we could be in this cycle forever, like every year there's going to be new covids because they keep mutating in people 
Um, what's, what's the truth behind that? Yeah. I mean, every year we have new influenzas and, you know, that's been going on for hundreds of years and we never freaked out about that before, you know, and they, they estimate somewhere between, you know, a hundred 250,000 people die a year in the United States from influenza. Um, but we don't necessarily diagnose them with influenza. We just know that during influenza season, there's going to be a lot of excess deaths and they don't necessarily die from, you know, viral pneumonia. They might die from complications of other things. They get a bacterial pneumonia or they have a heart attack or they have a stroke that's brought on by the influenza. And, you know, we try to vaccinate people against influenza. Our vaccines aren't great. Um, it's hard to get people to be, to, to agree to be vaccinated, even high risk people. It's hard to get them to agree to do it. Um, that was long before COVID. We couldn't get people to be vaccinated against the flu. So, um, I, I think it's going to be more like that. Uh, but you know, every once in a while, there's a really horrible flu that comes out, uh, that, you know, and in 1918, you had one that, you know, killed, you know, hundreds of millions of people around the globe. So. I think we, we could have, uh, you know, every decade or, or every 20 years, maybe a really serious strain of COVID that's going to kill a lot of people uh, in the same way that we had influenza. So, um, yeah, I, I think it is going to keep mutating and whatnot. I, I guess one point that I should try to make uh, is that I think there's been a real shift, um, both in our public health approach, but also having to do with um, the tools that we have at our disposal. And that was the, what I was trying to get at at the beginning was that in the beginning, the goal was to try to stop the spread of COVID. We are no longer trying to do that. In the beginning, the idea was I should try to protect the community. I should get vaccinated to protect other people. I should wear a mask to protect other people. We have left that strategy behind. Now, the Chinese are still pursuing that strategy. Right. They are still trying for zero COVID and it is stymieing them and it is actually really bogging down their economy. And it's reverberating here. Right. A lot of our inflation has to do with supply chain issues. And some of that is because factories are closed in China because they're trying to get to zero COVID. And, you know, it just looks like that's not possible. Um, and um we have shifted our strategy and we're sort of at now what you do is to protect yourself. And so everything that we do is to protect ourselves. And it's totally reasonable as a strategy because our ability to prevent the spread to everybody else is not great. You know, we could have everybody wear masks all the time, but people hate wearing masks and it really, uh, you know, it detracts from quality of life and it, it, detracts from, you know, people um, interacting with each other. And mm. uh, you see the happiness, you know, I went to a medical conference, just the happiness of people being able to get together again, even if they're wearing masks, um, we're just, and, and people being able to travel <clears throat> and see their loved ones. And um, so I'm really glad that those original things are no longer necessary. Um, but as an individual, now you have to think about what are the risks to you? And so again, if you're young and healthy, the risks are pretty small. And so you may decide to take fewer precautions. If you're in your seventies or eighties uh, and you have some health concerns, you should be really careful. Um, and uh, so what does that mean? It means um, when you're indoors, try not to be with large numbers of people. Um, that doesn't mean you can't see your immediate family or have a few friends that you get together with. Um, and when you're indoors, you, you may want to wear a mask. Um, for sure, if you need to go into a, a, a large group of people indoors, you should be wearing a mask. And the kind of mask you should wear, at the very least, is a, is a well-fitting N95 mask. They also make N99s and N100s. Um, you know, those filter out even more particles and those are probably the best protection, um, but they are more expensive. So, um, you know, that's a, a kind of trade off. But I would say an N95 is that's kind of like the minimum level of protection that you want 
if you're going into a group of people because the other masks just they're not going to do it with the current variants that we have. So I've been seeing something in the news about elastomeric masks um, that I guess are, you know, you buy them once for like 30 to $60 and then you change the filter like once a month or a couple times a year. Um, but mo most of them look like, you know, World War One gas masks. I think so, so, some are a little more yeah. stylish. <laughs> Like, yeah, you know, there's also there also so is like again, a, you I think, know, a you know, trash crisis. Uh, I think, you know, it, it really just depends on, um, you know, how much time do you need to spend with other people, you know, and how uncomfortable are the masks that you have? You know, I mean, I, I use N95s. I buy them at Home Depot and, you know, I don't know, they're a dollar or two a piece. And, you know, I'll, I'll wear it probably eight hours. Um, so, you know, I have to, I have to go into work, uh, and work in my, you know, seeing patients half a day a week. So that's four hours that I got the mask on. It's, it's pretty miserable. Um, I, I wear the mask, um, when I go to synagogue cause it's a, a room full of people and they're singing and, you know, only about half of them are wearing masks. So, uh, again, I want to protect myself. Um, but um, but I don't avoid those, uh, you know, those interactions. Uh, and I would go to the theater. I would go to, uh, you know, the symphony, but I would wear a mask for that, too. Um, rather do stuff outside. I, I love doing stuff outside and uh, you can see it, you know, um, every summer we've got the waves in the south where people are going indoors because it's too hot out. And then in the winter, we get the waves in the north when it's too cold out. Um, so uh -huh. the outside, even with the, with the new variants, I think is, is still pretty safe. Gotcha. So I just have a sort of a grab bag of questions that I've been, I've been jotting down. Um, okay. One of them Great. is about uh, testing and sort of public health uh, reporting. So, you know, every day I read the New yeah. York Times and it has the list of new cases, hospitalizations and deaths. And I don't know that anyone's yeah. reporting new cases. Any like, what, what is there any value in those numbers anymore? Uh, yeah, there's values in the numbers. First of all, the hospitalizations for sure, right? Because there, everyone who gets admitted to the hospital gets tested. So we have some idea of uh, you know what the rates of um, hospitalization are uh, for the whole population. We don't know the rates per infection. But you can be pretty sure that, you know, whatever rates are reported, it's probably something like 10 times that many uh, because now everyone's getting diagnosed at home and they don't report it to anybody. Um, mm. But I, I think we still do have a good idea of how many hospitalizations and how many deaths there are. And you'll see, I mean, if you look at the deaths, they really, you know, they, they really dropped off and you haven't seen a, a rise uh, with the latest wave. So um, I, I think that, you know, this is a much less um, a much less dangerous variant than what we had before. Gotcha. What do you think about um, home testing these days? You know, I, I would get my eight uh, kits, you know, from the Postal Service. And um, and I know people who are like, I'm sure I have covid, but I keep testing negative. Like, is is, is there a. a mm -hmm. A responsible way to test for yourself and others? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's kind of like if you think about, you know, what if you knew you had the flu? What if you knew you had some other, you know, I, I mean, you know, when you have a respiratory infection and the question is, how much do you care about other people and trying to keeping them from getting it? And so keeping them from getting COVID is kind of like keeping them from getting the flu, like, you know. If you know you're positive, or even if you didn't know you had COVID, but you know you've got some other miserable respiratory infection, you know, try to wear a mask. Don't don't give it to other people. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's if you went around like <clears throat> in Asia, you know, 10, 20 years ago, you see lots of people wearing masks in public. It's it's very normal there. In the United mm. States, you, you, you know, you look like some kind of a pariah walking around with a mask before COVID and people would wonder, you know, but there it's sort of like, you know, it's polite. If you have a cold, you don't want to give it to other people. You wear a mask. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that 
people could do that here too. Um, that is to say, you know, if, if you're infected and you test negative, just wear a mask around other people so that you, you know, are less likely to give it to them. And, you know, don't invite them to come over your house until you're feeling better. Yeah, I, I have to say that it's, like, you know, OK, so I don't have any symptoms, but I know that other people aren't going to think that way. Like when I go to Costco or the supermarket, I kind of like to wear a mask now. Yeah. Just just for like whatever germs people have gotten, they're going to be coughing and sneezing up in, in the air. Yeah. And, and you know, I do that, too. I, I don't know if COVID went away, if I would still do it. But, um, you know, like I said, I don't like wearing a mask. But I really, you know, it's been like two and a half years since I had my last upper respiratory infection. And it's kind of nice. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, I used to get sidelined for at least a few days every year. You know, I, I, it never kept me from going to work, but I felt crappy. And now I never have that. So, uh, I, you know, that seems like an advantage to me, but that's a personal choice. This is like a lot of those things is like that they were saying at the beginning of the pandemic. A lot of those things have come true now. You know, it is a personal choice. You're deciding for yourself how much protection you want to. Have. You don't have to worry. You know, one of the things that's that has like really bothered me in sort of liberal spaces is this thing where now they say, you know, like if I want to go to my scientific meeting, I have to show proof of vaccination. What the hell? The vaccine doesn't prevent the transmission of Omicron. So why do I have to be vaccinated? I'm vaccinated because I want to protect myself so I don't get hospitalized. But I don't think that my meeting should decide whether or not I am going to get hospitalized. Right. I mean, that, I don't think it's their job to protect me against myself. But, you know, having them require everyone to wear masks seems very reasonable. So they're going to try to keep people from spreading it within the thing. It's just that vaccination doesn't prevent spread anymore. Maybe the new one that comes out in fall will help because there's going to be an Omicron vaccine that comes out that will presumably help to prevent the spread of Omicron. But by the time it comes out, we may be into the next letter. You know? uh -huh. All right. See, yeah, there's another question, um, you know, about the, the new vaccines. And of course, they're always going to be playing catch up. Um, I read recently about a uh, an AI computer that is now doing like protein folding, uh, which is you know an exceedingly difficult problem for humans to solve. But apparently like this AI, I, DeepMind or something is has like done more proteins in the last three months than humans had done throughout through history until now. And so since the 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 virus is essentially protein is. Yeah. Are you know, is, is it going to be, you know, can you just sort of like do you see a, a time in the near future where vaccines are just going to be like, you know, you know, produced like publish on demand? Well, I mean, it's it's not that far from that right now. It's just that, you know, the the process of getting it up and running takes a while, you know, just to get it, you know, into production, to make enough of it and then to ship it to all the places to vaccinate 100 million people or 500 million people like that. That's a that's a process. Right. I mean, you get the you can get the first ones out maybe in a month or two. Um, but, you know, there's testing and there's regulatory approvals and there's all kinds of stuff like it's not going to happen, you know, that you need one and, and they're going to make it at your local CVS and you can go pick it up. I mean, these are still made in, you know, highly technical factories that there's only a few in the whole world. And so I, I don't see that happening, but I was surprised mm -hmm. that it took this long for them to come up with a booster that was specific to a variant instead of using a booster from a back, you know, from a virus that's two years old. Uh huh. Is it seems weird that the vaccines are still mostly delivered subcutaneously. Like it's, it seems like a pretty awkward way to do it. Are there are there technologies around vaccination that could be, you know, oral or nasal or or dermal? Yeah. There are. I mean, you know, and and they've been used with, you know, varying success. We got the oral polio vaccine was around for a long, long time. And the problem with the oral polio vaccine is that it's a 
you know, it's a weakened virus, but it can revert in a very small number of cases to a, to a sort of a wild type virus. And now we've got polio cases in New York that are vaccine derived. Hmm. So, um, you know, so, so there are, there are risks to that. There's a nasal flu vaccine, um, which was very popular for a while. And then it ended up not being effective for a number of years. And, um, so I think that this is just the technology that we're most um, familiar with and, and that's had the most testing and seems to be, you know, to work consistently. Um, I don't think that most people are choosing not to be vaccinated because they're afraid of needles. I, I think that, you know, it's it's other things going on. Um, and, and what we saw, you know, when they came out with the nasal vaccine for flu, they thought, oh, this is going to get kids vaccinated you know, cause kids are afraid of needles. Turns out kids don't like having stuff squirted up their nose either. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. If only, if only we could give vaccines via video games. <laughs> um, but um, the other thing, the other thing that, you know, that uh, AI and is, you know, there's, there's drug development. And when you look at how quickly they came up with the antiviral pills, um, you know, compared to how long it took to develop antivirals for other diseases, it was really, really rapid. You know, we had remdesivir within like a year and Paxlovid now, um, you know, like two years after the thing. And, and it's extremely effective. You know, I mean, the fact that you can reduce death by 90% with a pill uh, is, is really pretty extraordinary. Hmm. Um, so talking about other other ways of reducing your risk, um, you know, in my community, sort of, you know, plant based lifestyle medicine, when it when when this all started happening, we were all screaming like, OK, this is an example of how chronic diseases all of a sudden became acute. Um, do you, are there is mm -hmm. there still is there evidence around, you know, healthy lifestyle things that can protect you even if you get it? even if you get COVID or some, some variant? I, I'm not sure that after you've gotten it, that there's much you can do at that point. But uh, I think certainly if you're living a healthy lifestyle, um, you know, if you're physically fit and you're not obese and you don't have diabetes and, you know, that all of those things help to protect you, uh, you know, from, from getting COVID in the first place. Uh, or if you get it having a, you know, a sort of a milder case, um, you know, part of what happens is as we age, uh, you know, chronic diseases are basically just a process of aging. And so if you're able to maintain your, you know, sort of like your real age as younger than your biological age, then you're going to do better. Mm. Um, but again, you know, if you look at the vast majority of people who died of COVID were over the age of 75. Um, so it, it's, you know, when you're, if you're, if you're 25 or 30, it's hard to, you know, really do that much to change your risk because your risk just isn't very high. Um, but I think that the, you know, and, and you shouldn't think that like, Oh, if I do all this stuff, then I don't need to wear a mask or, you know, I'm, I'm going to be like, you know, these diseases have evolved to, to kill people <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and infect people at least. And they're, they're very good at it. So, um, you know, right. well, I, I you don't know, think I, that, I don't think that. Yeah. I, I don't, uh, you know, take off my seatbelt just because I stop at red lights. Like, yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I think there's a, a, a lots and lots of reasons to eat healthy, you know, to eat healthy food and in, in moderate amounts and to exercise. Like you don't need COVID to get you to do that. There are so many other things that so many other benefits that you get from it. Um, so I would say COVID might be a small, tiny side effect of it, but th th I wouldn't make that my main driver. Okay. Um, the, the one thing that, that I don't think has been uh, resolved yet, um, you know, is, is that there are some randomized trials of uh, vitamin D uh, to prevent upper respiratory infections uh, in general, not specifically COVID. That does seem to be maybe the one thing that vitamin D actually has been shown to do in randomized trials, but it's only for people who are vitamin D deficient. Okay. So, um, you know, 
during COVID, I've been taking vitamin D in the winter and I, I'm not at all convinced that it's doing anything, but it's, it's easy enough to do. Yeah. I saw some interesting research that I didn't dive into enough to be able to evaluate. Someone said that the vitamin D was actually sort of a, a marker of uh, light exposure and that that may be more important sort of, uh, you know, light, light on the skin might. Uh, yeah, you know, might. I, I mean, what we know is that vitamin D levels are associated with all kinds of things like everything, you know, cancer and heart disease and diabetes and all cause mortality, you name it, like pretty much anything bad. If your vitamin D levels are low, you're more likely to have that thing. Mm -hmm. um, what's unfortunate is that, you know, the, there have been lots and lots of randomized trials looking at giving people vitamin D. The most recent one came out last week that showed that vitamin D doesn't prevent fractures uh, in people who have osteoporosis. You know, and that's sort of like, if anything that you needed vitamin D for, it was that. So I think that, you know, we really seen study after study after study show that by giving vitamin D, you don't change anything except for this one thing, which is upper respiratory infections. There have been a bunch of studies and it does look like if you're vitamin D deficient and you take vitamin D, you will reduce your risk of upper respiratory infections. Whether that applies to COVID, we don't know. Um, but vitamin D is cheap and it, you know, it doesn't seem to be harmful. I wouldn't take tons of it, you know, a thousand units a day or something. Um, and that's probably, you know, and, and it may not work for that either, you know, um, but in terms of like why vitamin D levels are associated with all these other things, we don't know. So sunshine, sure. That's a possibility, you know, uh -huh. but you know, I don't know what else sunshine would do for you that would, you know, make you less likely to get cancer, for example. Yeah. Well, I saw something recently about uh, we can actually photosynthesize a little bit if we, you know, if you have a lot of leafy greens and then the, uh, the chlorophyll is <laughs> in your blood that that actually, the, you know, like, uh -huh. like inside your skull is not that dark, apparently, like, you know, so I don't know. <laughs> Well, what I, what I will say is I take a daily vitamin yeah. D and K2 and it's delicious. It's like a really wonderful little gummy. <laughs> so. I mean, you know, the, the whole idea of vitamins, you know, they were really, really exciting when people discovered them because the deficiencies of vitamins, you know, cause really recognizable syndromes. Um, which are, you know, sometimes devastating. You know, you look at what scurvy used to do, uh, you know, to sailors uh, and, and Antarctic explorers. And I mean, this was the thing that people were terrified of mm -hmm. and had no idea what caused it. And, you know, we really have no reason to have it anymore. Um, and so, you know, the, the vitamins are absolutely essential to life. But, you know, if you eat a healthy diet, you're going to get plenty of vitamins. There's no shortage. So, um, you know, there's billion dollar industries of, you know, selling people stuff that they don't need. I don't know if I can say that on your show, but yeah. there's no scientific <laughs> evidence, really, any of the vitamins. Um, but, you know, there people like to take them. So, yeah. well, there go there goes Solar Ray as a sponsor. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um so the other thing I was curious about is when you know when we first started talking, it was in March of 2020. You were kind of shocked at the unpreparedness and the incompetence of sort of the public health infrastructure around, like how few tests mm -hmm. the CDC had and and how slowly they ramped up. So now we've got monkeypox, yep. which as you know, like, have we learned anything from COVID? Are we better equipped? What's going on? Why? Like, is, is it just sort of political sniping and this new thing that people are really working on hard? Or do we still have this level of apathy and incompetence? No, I, I don't think I mean, I think the thing is with COVID, you know, monkeypox is not COVID. COVID, it, it, this was a highly transmissible thing and you could see it coming 
for a couple of months. You know, you saw what it did in China, you saw what it did in Italy. And if you thought that it wasn't going to do that here, you know, you had to be sticking your head in the ground to, to think that somehow it wasn't going to come to America. This is something that's transmitted through the air to everybody. Um, well, I guess back then we didn't know it was coming through the air, but you know, it, it was just like, it was so obvious that it was being transmitted, you know, that you had to have some kind of denial or some kind of, I don't know, racism is the right, right word for it, but to think that like, you know, we are Americans somehow different from these other people. We aren't going to need these tests. We aren't going to need, you know, but we've come a long way from that. You know, we do have tests for monkeypox and we do have vaccine for monkeypox. And, you know, it's just that, um, you know, we haven't, had to give it out before and so you know now we realize it hasn't been here for that long um i think they'll ramp it up i think they'll get it under control um you know i think that in the beginning it was you know um sort of thought that this is only through sort of so close sexual contact and that always makes a lot of people say well it doesn't apply to me i don't need to worry about it and um and and then you know sort of like well it's kind of like a punishment that people are getting for their morality. And, you know, so maybe we shouldn't do anything about it anyway. And so, but, you know, I, th I think that, you know, most of the scientific community is bought into it. I think the government's concerned about it. And uh, I think that, you know, as the cases has ra have ramped up, their attention has ramped up. And I, I think they'll get it under control. Okay. Do we know how it spreads beyond um you know, se sexual contact between males? Uh, no, but um, I mean, we, we know that it's we know that it's spread through contact. So if you if you touch the you know, if you touch somebody who's got it, if you touch the the vesicles that you know, that that's that's sort of the main way of spread. We don't know if there's some airborne spread as well, um, but it's clearly not. You know, this isn't something that's being spread through the air at Costco. And the fact that it was so concentrated in homosexuals in the beginning, you know, implies that there is a certain degree of, of uh, you know, close contact that's required. Otherwise, you wouldn't have seen that pattern. Um, so, no, I don't think that we know completely how it's spread, but I, I also don't think that, you know, I think it's mostly going to be close contact and, you know, you, you feel comfortable going into Costco and buying your stuff and don't worry about gotcha. it too much. So, so when you look at oh, like the also next... like people our age, we got we got smallpox vaccine, so you know we're we should be pretty protected. Oh, cool! So a little decoration on my arm. <laughs> <Coming Yeah. ready. laughs> it did something, yeah. All right. So when you look at like the next ten years in terms of public health, in terms of like you know how COVID was politicized how it played into a polarization like do you like do you think we're we're better prepared now do you think like what what are like knowing that things happen that diseases happen there's you know 100 year cycles of plague and things like that what are you hopeful about and what are you worried about oh well i mean i'm very hopeful about the science i mean our response to this was, you know, that the speed with which they developed the vaccines and the effectiveness of the vaccines. And, you know, when you think about like, you know, it was such a triumph with HIV that, you know, within, I don't know, a year or two of the time that, that they really understood that HIV was this thing, they had actually figured out what the virus was that caused it and they had sequenced the virus and whatever. And then within, you know, sort of 20 to 30 years, we had converted it from a, a death sentence into just a sort of a chronic disease with a pill that you take once a day and it's pretty well controlled with that, right? And then, you know, COVID, you know, within a couple of weeks of the first case, we got the thing sequenced. We know what's, you know, what's causing it and, you know, Within a year, we've got a vaccine for it that's highly effective. And then we've got medications for it. I mean, like our ability, our scientific abilities are just, you know, 
moving at a tremendous clip. And so I'm very hopeful about that in terms of, you know, our ability to fight disease in the future, um, that the, the medicine is just really, really good. Um, and what we discovered was that the politics are really, really bad. And um, I don't think that has anything to do with the disease itself. I think it's the period that we're living through and it's not just here, it's every country around the globe. Um, and, you know, that makes me, you know, worried. I think we've, we've talked about this before. It's, you know, it's, it looks a lot like the 1930s and that didn't turn out well. So, um, you know, I think that, uh, I, I think this is a, a, a bad time in, um, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, we've got all kinds of international problems and uh, the same kind of polarization that's taking place within the country is taking place outside of the country. And uh, this just isn't, a, it's, it's not a very cooperative time for humans. Um, hopefully that'll pass without a, you know, some kind of big, horrible conflict. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm very optimistic about the science and, and the ability of, of humans to get a handle on the causes of disease and to, to make progress. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Do, I know. No, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's part of this bigger context. I mean, I'm, you know, full disclosure, I'm looking at like, are there other countries to go to? And, and you know, the more I look, so, like, oh, OK, that country looks like it might be might be politically stable, but we looked like we were politically stable in 2015. <laughs> And how fast that changed. Yeah. And what about, you know, the climate? Like, I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, we didn't move to North Carolina as sort of like this survivalist bunker mentality. But like, goodness, we we haven't had heat domes. We haven't had flash floods. We haven't had, you know, a terrible destructive hurricane in 25 years. Um, we haven't, you know... <laughs> Like, it seems like, oh, I kind of, you know, we kind of lucked out here, but like, who knows what, you know, where is going to be habitable or, or pleasant or, or sustainable Ohio. for humans? <laughs> Ohio. <laughs> yeah. All the people who left, come back. <laughs> we have lovely weather. <laughs> uh, yeah. Turns no out natural disasters. No, you know, uh -huh. everything seems to like, shift around us in both directions, the, the heat waves, the, the thunderstorms, the everything. So and all you had to do was um, have teams, sports teams that never won. And, and that was the deal. Yes, struck. yes. That's our that's our compensation. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anything else you wanted to talk about around COVID or that we haven't covered? No, I think we pretty much uh, pretty much hit all the the highlights of it. You know. Okay. Oh, um, you know what? I I, think, I did have one know, more question. That main. Yeah. 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 Um, I, every couple of weeks, I see a new newspaper article about scientists think they figured out what causes long COVID or what characteristics predispose people to long COVID or like what what do you what do you know about what we know about i i don't think we know very much about long COVID, you know and um i i think it's it, it may you know if we ever do solve it it may give us a um a window into understanding some of these other conditions you know there are a lot of things out there you probably remember from like the 1990s people with chronic fatigue syndrome fibromyalgia you know there these are the things that are like the bane of of you know, primary care doctors existence, you know, the people, cause they, they have these diseases that, you know, you go and you look and you can't find any lab values that are abnormal, but it really affects people's lives, you know, and, and they feel terrible and the, the doctors feel terrible and um, a lot of them are depressed. And, uh, and I think long COVID kind of falls into that same, you know, category and these people mm. that think they have chronic Lyme disease and, you know, that these are just all like, you know, kinds of symptoms that, um, you know, they're, they're, they're subjective symptoms, you know, lots of headaches and trouble concentrating and whatever, but you can't, you know, sort of do an EEG and see where their thinking has gone wrong or where the headache is coming from or an MRI doesn't show anything. And, you know, so I think that, um, 
we're really, if, if we make any progress on this, maybe it'll give us a window into understanding all of these conditions. Mm. Well, you know, in, in times past, people who couldn't be served by, you know, the lab tests and, and diagnostics of traditional medicine would go to alternatives would go to, you know, different yep. kinds of healers. Now it seems everybody's going to functional medicine, um, which like these people typically have MDs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh -huh. I don't know, I don't know if there's, you know, I don't know in terms of scientific evidence, if there's anything to it. It certainly, it certainly see, like it talks a, a, a good game, like, oh, this makes sense. Like, you know, they can't see it on these lab tests. Yeah. Like, is there anything to it as far as the the, the science? Um, so uh, we've done a few studies of functional medicine. And um, the one consistent finding is that the people that participate in the functional medicine lose more weight than control patients. Oh. So it does seem to be good for weight loss. I'm not sure if it does anything else. Oh, uh -huh. and, and people feel better. And so that that's not, you know, that's not a, a thing to minimize. They, they do feel better. Um, so, you know, in terms of their like patient reported outcomes, the people in functional medicine do, they do feel better. Um, you know, whether, the, the, you know, we haven't seen that it's made any difference in anything, any, you know, physiological measures other than weight. So I think that, you know, a lot of functional medicine is diet changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that eating a healthier diet it makes people lose weight. Uh -huh. um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, all of these things, like if they, if they get back to, you know, eat a healthy diet and exercise, like that gets you a long way. That seems to be a foundation of a lot of these different things. And then after that, it's all, well, you should pay me money because I have this secret trick that nobody else knows about. Uh -huh. Um, but at the heart of, our, of both of those things, you know, is, is the diet and the exercise. And, and I'm not sure that there's one particular diet that's, you know, the one that everybody needs to follow. But, you know, we do know the things that people shouldn't eat. Um, and, and that's what most Americans are eating. So, um, uh -huh. you know, but so uh, it's a little bit like stone yeah. soup or something like uh you know, take this pill after eating a salad and going for a 30 minute walk. Yeah, yeah. Cool. But take this the specific combination of these vitamins that are manufactured by this particular manufacturer, because, you know, they're the only ones who who make the real stuff. All the other ones, you can't trust them. And you need to have this combination for your particular problem. And you know, I I don't know that any of that stuff makes a difference. Gotcha. Cool. Well, so uh, eating right and exercising, could, you, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why this podcast is on the cutting edge. So, uh, <laughs> cool. Well, Michael, it's always, always a pleasure. Always great to talk with you. Alex. Yeah, this is fun. We got we to gotta make this, uh, got to put it in my calendar regularly. So, uh, a reality check. So absolutely happy to join you again. Cool. Again, lo love the background. Love the choice of uh, of colors. Is that is that paint or, or fabric all over on your walls? <laughs> that is paint. Oh, the house came like this. We said, oh, we got to change that. But that was 10 years ago. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure it's a wavelength that that supports your um, your your higher brain functioning and and uh, cellular activity. <laughs> Absolutely. So. All right, man. So I'm I'm gonna right. I'm gonna stop the recording. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I see. For the, like, you're one of the only people who is uploading slower than me. I don't I don't know if I can move to Ohio, but just, <laughs> we have to we have to keep the uh, this window open after we close the the recording before it completely uploads. So you'll. Sounds uh, good. <laughs> so, so I'll have to follow you later. All right, man. Catch you later.